My name's Saskia. I'm the founder of the Institute for Art and Olfaction. We're based here in Los Angeles. Uh, so Mary, I'm going to start with an introduction and then we'll just get into it. Sure. Mary Richardson-Lowry is a former partner practicing in commercial transaction and government relations at Meyer Brown LLP, an international law firm whose home office is in Chicago. During her career, Mary also served in government in various capacities. Um, this isn't in her bio that she sent me, but I think it warrants sharing because it's kind of amazing. So recognized by, by Crane's 100 Most Influential Women in 2004, Richardson Lowry also is the recipient of the Abraham Lincoln Center Humanitarian of the Year Award in 2010, as well as the National Diversity Council's Most Powerful and Influential Women in Illinois Award in 2011, and has been appointed to numerous boards and commissions, including serving as immediate past president of the City of Chicago Board of Education. Uh, before embarking on her legal career, in fact, before she started high school, Mary began paying close attention to beauty and fragrance. As a 12-year-old, she began noticing how products affected her skin, as well as how they impacted her being. For her, beauty was within everyone, a true reflection of self. Having been raised by parents who taught her the importance of self-reliance and proactively solving problems, Mary began blending and adding ingredients to achieve the best results. Even while her legal career advanced, friends and colleagues would ask what she was wearing. Her nose was natural, self-taught, and exceptional. Mary's legal career took various turns, but her passion for beauty and fine fragrance never waned, and she continued creating products over the years. Which brings us to today. Uh, ultimately, Mary chose to pursue her passion with a trusted partner and co-founder who's also on the call, Brenda. Hi, Brenda. Um, and Identity Narrative was created. So what you're seeing here on the screen share is the Identity Narrative website, which we'll be sharing in the chat as well. So. Um, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you, Mary, to our latest edition of Meet and Knows. And we're really happy and honored to have you. Uh, and how's it going out there in Chicago? <laughs> it's warm, not yeah. quite as warm as California. But Chicago is, um, I guess, seasonably warm. We're now at the beginning of September. Um, we tend to get this warm burst before it. we have a very short fall and a very intense winter. So um, we enjoy the fall when it arrives and we prepare ourselves for the winter. But um, I think it's otherwise quiet in the midst of the um, vestiges of a pandemic. It's yeah, quiet. yeah. I think that, uh, I mean, yeah. I, the coldest I've ever, ever been was in January in Chicago where I wore a pair of tights. I wore a pair of tights and a little sweater jacket thing. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I basically like, was like, oh. a, a store and had you buy undergarments. Yeah. And you, you later, realize later. people can die, you know, from that, that's like, right. yeah. That's, and, people um, have. and people have, yeah, I, I imagine. So, so we'll, we'll get to the, the, the heavier stuff, but let's start at the beginning of your, of your, of your practice. So uh, in your bio, you talk about how even before high school, you started paying attention to beauty products. So how did this manifest as a kid? What, what, was, uh, what were the things that were catching you and are there any particular well, memories? I, I, it's interesting that your this um, uh, format that you've developed is uh, fo uh, focused on the nose. So when I was a child, my siblings called me the nose. I could always pick up a scent before someone else, something, and that's, it's carried with me throughout my entire life. So I've always been drawn to it. I respond to it, probably respond in a way that some people or surprise, I ask them what they're wearing, or sometimes I, if they have something heavy on their face and it's emitting a scent, I'll talk to them about that. Um, and, um, but scent has always been part of my DNA from the very beginning. Initially, adversely from my siblings, and eventually I understood it was a value and part of my purpose, and I began to continue to try to learn more about how I connected why that was important, what that meant in terms of my interaction with other people. And how do you connect scent to beauty? Because, I mean, they are related, you know. Um, uh, right. So um, initially, I think for many people, they think of scent in isolation. Um, but it certainly manifests itself in the form of beauty in, the, in that we, it defines, scent defines our choice what we emanate, what we gravitate for, towards, defines us. Uh, in part, that's our, why we gravitated towards identity narrative and how it reflects on the individual in terms of a brand name. 
Um, but beauty, um, being from California, uh, there's an expectation sometimes. People will think beauty is a surface discussion. And the people who often gravitate towards that are not from California. What we learned, what I learned in terms of growing up in California is the layered nature of beauty. Who you are, where you come from, what your race is, your class is, your ethnicity is, um, who you associate with, the things that you choose to adorn yourself with, how you present yourself, how you communicate um, to the world. All of those things for me um, connote wholeness, identity, beauty, completeness. Um, and then if you layer that with a scent, then it tells me that I'm trying to convey. So one of the things that we do is talk about um, the expression, identity expression, the expression that one is uh, communicating when one uh, chooses scent. And that all wraps up into a form of beauty for me. How did, how did you, I mean, how did, how did this awareness of this sort of layered nature of beauty start coming to you? Were you, were you already thinking about these things when you were a teenager or? Um... I was, a, I was you know, one of those odd kids. I like diversity. I was drawn to it. And the beauty of growing up in California, I was, it was around me every day in terms of um, diversity of, of the groups of people that I went around, the life experiences, how they chose to engage, where they chose to engage, with whom they chose to engage. It was, it was pretty complex. My father was um, initially in the military, so I was exposed to a mindset and existence that way. My mother was a teacher. I was exposed to a mindset and existence that way. My grandfather was a tinkerer, but he was also a linguist. So I spent a lot of time on reservations as a child. My mother, my grandmother was a missionary and she was, um, she was also a social worker. And sometimes we traveled to Mexico and uh, we certainly, again, spent some time on the reservation. So it was this sort of, I developed early on this broader based uh, perspective. Wow. Wow. So by reservations, you mean native, native reservations? Yes, I apologize. So no, no, no. California, some of us in California, those on the call will find this odd, but some of us summered in Arizona. She's, they don't shake your head. It's, it's, it's a thing. Um, my grandparents were in Arizona. Um, in Arizona, if, if it's 107 or 100, whatever, in, in California, it'll probably be 117 or something in Arizona it, in the summer. It's quite hot. But that's what I knew. That's where I spent my summers and, um, and developed a whole different group of people that I associated with. And that for me was a part of, to your earlier question around beauty and people and the things they evoke and the things that we're drawn towards. Um, so um, it's a, a, a really quite full circle there. That's pretty amazing. My husband was raised on various reservations in Arizona and New Mexico, so I, I'm very aware of the, it's a pretty cool, um, but so, so your conception of beauty, even quite young, seems in stark contrast to sort of how beauty is presented in, in the broader mainstream media, you know, as like the surface, like you're super foxy, basically, that's the extent of it, you know. Um, yeah. I was never opposed to those things. Yeah. Um, at certain points, um, one wants to present, evoke, a, a thing, an image, a, a um, uh, you want to connect on in certain ways. But in terms of the wholeness and the more complex and the depth and the layering, for me, that's, that's beauty in the person. It's mm -hmm. also, for me, the beauty in the scent. I knew right away that I couldn't characterize a top note, a middle note, and a bass note, but I knew that scent moved me that way, that how it smelled, my father gave me my first bottle because my, they called me the nose. He gave me my first bottle of joy. I was 12 years old. Wow, that's a sophisticated perfume for a 12 year old. <laughs> <laughs> but I, my, my, my father um, had another term for me. It looked sophisticated is a good, that's cleanup version. But I was a sort of an older mature child. Got and um, uh, my mother sometimes called me indignant because of different discussion. Um, but I was an older, mature child, and I had a very strong point of view. They knew early on that it was likely that I would be a, a lawyer. They didn't mm. know what else I would be 
Um, but they knew that would be part of my path. I didn't know it, but they said they did. Um, but I joy because I always commented on how people, um, what they were emitting. And I probably even at 12 was using the word emit after I looked it up in the dictionary because I was on the best terms with the dictionary at a very early age. And um, my father bought me joy. Um, what he didn't explain to me is the fragility of the bottle. So I probably had it about oh. two weeks before I broke the bottle. Oh boy. I never told him. I was so embarrassed, but it taught me about responsibility, et cetera. Um, but he introduced, if you're, if you want to see something special, this is special. I want to introduce you to the thing you speak of. And I knew when I put on my first, when I first applied it, it had, I had one reaction. Sometime later, I had a different sense. Um, but that bass note that took me through hours and hours, even as a child, I said, this, it's something I was connecting, but I couldn't give a voice to it. And I could only give a voice to it later in life. Wow, it's a, first of all, what a great dad. And second of all, what a great, what a great introduction to sort of fine fragrance, you know, as we understand it. Because Joy is obviously one of the best perfumes, right? I have a hard time with Joy. I, I, to me, it's, it's almost too sophisticated for me. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I have a hard time sort of unpacking it, but so, so you say that your parents knew you were going to be a lawyer. Um, so what was it that, that they were seeing in you? Uh, was it a, a capacity to defend points of view? Um, to defend if there was someone who was being put upon in my family, in my circle of friends, I would be right there to defend them mm. in any way. Um, if I thought it was a just cause, mm. um, I, I was uh, constantly analyzing things. A scent, you can see with the fragrance, I was analyzing components early on before I even knew that's what I was doing. Yeah. Um, I would break down an argument someone would make with respect to an issue and then recast it and give it back to them. Um, and I loved and still love the, uh, the debate. You uh, debate around fragrance, de debate around whatever the subject matter a contractual matter. I love that. I love the engagement. I love what it brings out in me. I also love what it brings out in other I, others. I learn a lot about them. Um, so they had a sense of that. When I was about um, 14, my, I had five sisters and one brother. And wow. when I was about 14, um, I noticed there was a disparity in treatment from my perspective uh, with my brother and my siblings. Um, in terms of the chore distribution. So at, um, I, at 14, I, I asked my parents if I could call a meeting. And they looked at me as if, what is wrong with this child? That's um, awesome. I wanted to have a discussion, uh, ergo a debate around why there was a disparity in treatment between my brother, my siblings and I, the females and the male. That was probably a formative introduction for me and why the uh, a more gender neutral approach to life was the better approach to life. But my dad reminded me of that probably close to his passage, that I was that kid that would not um, let go of that um, different treatment in males and females. And I wanted to better understand and then advocate for why there should be parity. But yeah, and, and, and absolutely, you know, but it's amazing. Uh, how did your siblings react to this? Were they kind of like, oh, you know. Oh, there she goes again. Yeah, okay. Oh, that's scary. Yeah. Um, sometimes they would add comments, but it was more my thing than their thing. Yeah. One of the things I also learned growing up in a large family is every personality was different. And people would um, pursue different interests. They would express themselves differently in all forms. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and that was welcomed. Uh, so I learned to embrace the notion of inclusivity and diversity just within my, my own family. Own family. That, that was an important issue for me, a preoccupation with me, 
it wasn't necessarily a preoccupation with everyone else. Sure. But my parents understood the importance of allowing me, and I, I get it now. At the time, I thought I was, you know, just uh, moving them in a certain way, but they allowed me that opportunity to express myself that way. Yeah, they sound like amazing parents. So, okay, so you have parents who were, you know, in the army and teachers, and then you had grandparents who were linguists, missionaries. So it does feel like in, in your family, there is this sense of sort of social engagement, you know, that kind of, obviously, you inherited uh, through these through these generations. And w w within, your, within your career, which was driven, you know, uh, how did you keep in touch with your passion for beauty and fragrance? And how did, did it inform your career in any way? Or was it, did you keep it sort of separate? Um, um, there, they, there were separate paths in, in many respects. The nature of law, the legal practice, it's, it's a rigid thing. Um, you can't be too creative in the practice of law. The law is the law. They call it the black letter of the law. So you have to operate within its bounds. People get too cute, they get themselves in trouble, um, and they're not an effective uh, representative. Um, having said that, because of the rigor, the juxtaposition of that was always um, leaning into outside of that my creative um, interest um, and that was fragrance and beauty and topical agents and hair treatments and when I was in undergraduate in San Francisco I um, was a counselor at a Florence Crittenden which is a group home for girls and um, one of the ways that I connected with them um, on my journey was again just through doing things. I put go in the kitchen and I'd put together products. Um, they didn't have the resources for it. Um, I was in college. I didn't have the resources for it, but I knew how to put together products through what was in the kitchen, and sometimes what was in the um, um, the, the other the cabinets. And I would reformulate existing products that were in the cabinets so that I could sit and talk with them. Um, while I put something on their hair or on their face, wow. or I combine different perfumes that the, the girls had to create something new. And what I was trying to convey to them is the importance of reaching beyond the moment, because many of them were subject to um, some challenges in their lives, um, horrific conditions, horrific circumstances. Um, some had uh, children early, and I wanted them to see beyond their mo that moment. So in college, I continued to pursue uh, that creative outlets that way. Once I was um, in law school, it was really full on focus. Um, but in the evenings, one of the things I do just as a to transport myself was to mix something together, and. Um, while I was listening at the time, you would um, read into tapes, so you would be able to recall constitutional law, contracts law, property law, etc. I would uh, mix scents, um, oils, etc., and it helped me to get through uh, the moment. I continued to do that once I went on to um, to into the working world in various forms. So it, it was an important part of my existence. It wasn't the dominant part of my existence, but I carried it with me, oh, um, every day. Yeah, and, and you know, my, my father worked in city government. So when I was reading your bio, I was just like, I know what this is, you know, I know how this manifests in real life. And so I just want to share this with, with the crowd a little bit because I think it's really worth um, just the, the context that Mary brings to this. So Mary, in addition to, you know, getting her law degree, uh, went on to manage a large city of Chicago regulatory department from 98 to 2002, uh, the Department of Buildings, which oversaw regulations as it relates to all structures in the city of Chicago. I can only imagine the politics. I can't even, <laughs> I can only imagine, yeah. Uh, then served as an assistant to Mayor Richard Daley, managing multi-department agency initiatives from 94 to 98, and then went on to serve, or wait, I'm sorry, maybe before, also served as a commercial transactions and contracts negotiations attorney in the Department of Law for the city of Chicago as a supervising attorney, and, uh, and uh, uh, before that as assistant corporation counsel. So I I'm just sharing this because the, the level of sort of negotiation and diplomacy and I'm sure sort of civic stress that you've, you've you know, witnessed or possibly even been subject to is something worth uh, noting. And I find it very interesting that Scent sort of lived alongside this as a way of 
you know, I don't know, so maybe self-soothing even possibly. Maybe it. Indeed. It was a, 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 it was almost a therapeutic outlet. Yeah. Uh, particularly during a time when I was building commissions for the city, third largest city in the country, uh, intense issues, uh, the largest um, construction period um, of that time since they used to say since Miss O'Leary's cow, which was back in the 50s. Um, so there, it was a lot. Media attention um, more than I'd like. So I was a very um, upfront um, uh, leader, as they characterize me, and, um, and at the same time rewriting a regulatory code that dated back to 1957. My God. So it was a very intense, I have 500 employees, very intense time. Being able to remove myself in the evenings with just a creative release of mixing things and trying new things and trying them on other people. And I became known for that. So even through all of that, I would get calls from somebody saying, I'm having X issue, do you have any recommendations? And I you know, come up with something that I thought may, may be helpful to wow. them. Or I thought about X um, fragrance, have you tried it? What is it? Do you think it's, it reflects my personality, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, I continued to use it as an outlet. I also needed, um, a, a, from a career path, um, uh, law was very clear. It was very clear to my parents. It was very clear to me what I could achieve. And it was one of those, if you were willing to take on issues, you were oftentimes given more issues. Um, and, you can, and that allowed for professional growth. And I certainly benefited greatly from that growth, both in the public sector and the private sector. Once I was towards the end of uh, 30 years or so, um, I had kept coming back to this space of the creative part of myself. And I, my last, year before last, and um, uh, Mayor Brown Law Firm, um, I um, still traveled globally uh, every two years, um, sometimes every year, picking a different part of the world and going to that part of the world, um, which uh, we will get into later, I, I trust, but it factored into scent development for uh, Brenda and I. Um, but um, I, I needed a break desperately, um, and my travel family, as we call it, is a group of people I've been traveling with for decades. We chose uh, South Africa, Botswana, and Zimbabwe, wow. and I, I was literally on the Zambezi River, um, and uh, this boat, the boat was large enough for about 50 people, um, but there were maybe 10 of us. They had us on the, the upper deck. The views were fantastic the scent, the difference between the smell of grass there versus here, the smell of the inlets of the ocean there versus here, the animals versus here, the things that people decided to put on their skin versus here. I was on that boat and I was at a crossroad. And I said, do you, you've got 30 years in, the, the industry, that uh, the legal world is changing. This was post the 2008 um, um, constriction. Many of us had to remake ourselves once. It was in 2014, we're about to have to remake ourselves again uh, in order to um, be um, successful, continue to be successful in our legal careers. And I had to ask and answer whether or not that was something I was, wanted to do. I was getting lots of interest to jump to another firm or back into government or name the or, and mm. I couldn't make myself do it. And I was on that boat and I said, lean into the passion. And I'm tearing up now because yeah. at that moment, when I leaned into my passion, I knew yeah. that it was time for me to pursue this. Yeah. And shortly after I got back, Brenda and I got together and she was leaning towards something too. Mm -hmm. And I knew it was time for me to pursue the creative thing that had fueled me since I was a child. What a profound moment for you, you know? 
Yeah. It's um, those moments change our lives, don't they? You know, and it's brave. It's brave to lean in because it's scary. You know, you have this known that you are a high powered attorney who can work, you know, I mean, you, you can do that or you can try this new thing that, that is actually what you feel, you know, it was. And when I shared what I was going to do, you know, there was a saying, um, I think it came from my Angela, don't tell everybody your dreams. So when I shared so with some of the men in particular who are practitioners, what I was going to do, they're like, you're going to do what? But you're well known. You're this commercial mm-hmm. transactions lawyer. You're, you're the chief negotiator. You're the relationship of government relations person. This is what you do. And I mm-hmm. said, but that's not all of who I am. Right. And I traveled in the direction that was my next um, part of my purpose notwithstanding uh, uh, the um, concern that was ultimately expressed about my pursuing something that was, um, shall we say, an alternative to my current existence. Right, and unknown too. I mean, so was that the biggest challenge for you when you started out with, with um, and, and I know Identity Narrative is, is, a, is a company that is, that is part of a bigger umbrella company uh, that you started with, with Brenda. Hi, Brenda. Um, so, so tell it, tell me a little bit maybe about that first, that first, so you spoke about the emotional side. So then what were the next steps for you and what were the pragmatics of? Well, typically uh, being a profession and the profession that I learned, et cetera, I immediately, after Brenda and I sat and we decided, lighted on a direction in terms of what we wanted to do in terms of producing beauty products, fragrances, et cetera. Um, for me, the first thing was legal stru- structure and rigor. Um, what I knew, came to know throughout my entire career is that there were countless people with great ideas and they had no legal structure and rigor. That's... So we immediately put in place, and this is something I want to share with anyone who is listening. If you have a good idea, a good product, and you don't form the right structure for you, that good idea can be taken. That good mm-hmm. idea can be compromised. That good idea might be someone else's good idea, and you haven't done the due diligence associated with the name of your company, the name of your product, um, marking those, meaning a trademark pursued, um, content um, sometimes meaning a patent pursued, visual aids meaning a copyright pursued. It's really important that you lay that foundation because that allows you to build on your creative space in a way that um, gives it life, gives it a path forward. Um, If you don't have that structure, and I've come across countless people, Brenda sometimes would say, Mary, you're giving them too much, we're spending so much time counseling them on how to structure your your organization. But I want that desperately. The creative space is incredible. The entrepreneurial space is incredible. One of the things I found that we uh, collectively should continue to do better is give ourselves, put in place the business rigor so that we can really fully lean into our creative uh, endeavors. So I I just want to encourage people. And so we spent a lot of time doing that and we presently own a number of trademarks, et cetera. Um, But we spent a lot of time building um, uh, that as a foundation. Um, the, my business partner, Brenda, she has this a fantastic um, business development background, product development background, AI skills that I don't have. Um, so my creative juices, my nose, my legal wherewithal married with that, it made for a wonderful, collaborative, sometimes um, uh, put, uh, push and pull but all ultimately along the journey, trying to get to that great place of creative continuity um, and presenting brands that would resonate. So we spent um, a couple of years or so just doing that. Um, Mm -hmm. And we still are doing a lot of that because those things in terms of the continuity building, those things happen on on a continuum. Yeah, it it is. I, 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 I love that you said that because it is the truth uh, that if you build a building on crappy foundations, you know, you, you fall. And I mean, and I, you know, I've run, I've been running my nonprofit now for what, nine years, eight years. 
And I've seen every variation of nonsense, you know, that could have been avoided with clear structures, even, even contracts or, you know, um, so I, I super appreciate you saying that. And I think people really forget about it when they're like, oh, I have this great idea. Let's go do this. And they don't think about, yeah. I also, if you're involved in that, uh, just uh, adding one more thing please. for those who may um, be in their own d journey, um, if you want to engage in certain conversations with people, um, whether it's a marketing person, um, whether it's a co-packer, whether it is someone that you think is going to give you uh, certain levels of feedback, you might want to think about whether or not uh, the, uh, a, a, um, a agreement um, that limits their ability to share what you want to share with them. Yeah, like an NDA or, a, yeah. Sure, yeah. Um, an NDA, um, that um, non-disclosure agreement um, uh, for those who might be listening. Um, and, and it is um, important to consider that um, because not everyone will treat your information uh, with proprietariness, um, confidentially. And there's some things that you might not want to give too much information about absent having one of those things in place, one of those kinds of documents in place. I, also, I find it amazing because, so I, when I start things, I start with a website, right? I'm like, oh, I can build a website. I know how to do that. So I'll build a website and then, it, but I love that when you start things, you start with the legal structures because that's, <laughs> you know, it so well, you know, it's, it's incredible how we bring our own, you know, expertise, expertise to every sort of initiative. Um, Indeed. I was yeah. talking about it on the issue of flavors and the full uh, scale of it. Yeah. Someone I know um, was pursuing wine development. Um, they, that was not their um, uh, professional, um, initial professional calling, but it was something they were passionate about um, and had a good product, had done nothing to protect that product. Mm -hmm. So just having a conversation with them, how like someone else had uh, shea butter products, great product, had done nothing to protect that product. Brenda and I were at uh, a uh, artisan fair um, um, and uh, there was this food line, really good, really creative, really special. Um, but the name that they were using kept resonate, uh, resonating with me at like, where have I heard it? So I was sitting there, I went on my cell phone and I saw that it was resonating because it was someone else's. Oh dear. So I, it, I shared with them really gingerly that um, the picture of someone else's and I knew they would have a problem because I could look up quite quickly um, um, that this was a entity that existed five years preceding their entity. Yeah. So it would, um, um, and we bumped into that same group a year later and they wondered if I was prescient, I'm not. Um, because that they received a, um, Peace and a or exactly. Yeah. They received a notification that said they had to, they needed to stop using the name. Yeah. It's, it's pretty, it's, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's what, 10 minutes research on the internet, at least, you know, to, yeah. To, yeah, it's, it's silly, then, but YouTube now can give you a very pr a primer on these things. And, yeah. um, uh, certainly, um, the, uh, U S trademark, um, and patent commission, et cetera, they, they have uh, these videos that are, are useful. So I just encourage people to do that as they're pursuing their passion. Mm. I wonder if people don't do it because they don't have the comp, they don't believe that their project is ever going to be big enough to warrant that level of attention. I mean, I, sometimes I wonder that, like people just say, oh, I'm never going to be that big. And maybe it's a self-confidence thing. You know? I think it is a self-confidence. It's training. Some people just don't know. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking of a person who has this exquisite line of shoes uh, and she said it took her two years to get her first, I'm sorry, um, five years to get her first trademark. Wow. That should never have happened. Wow. So if you really aren't, if you don't educate yourself, there are people um, who can string you along um, because they are uh, imposing an hourly rate with retainers, et cetera. Um, so there's that issue. And there's a cost factor. If you're just starting off and you're trying to spin rel relative to the product, Allocate some resources for the business structure because to protect your product. Right. Okay, I'm so tempted to just ask you about legal stuff. I'm not going to do that. 
not going to do that (laughs) because I actually find this very fascinating. So um, let's move, let's move um, to to identity narrative um, as, as a, as a perfume brand. So we see from your vision statement that your company is rooted in inclusivity uh, and, and also uh, you approach perfume from an ungendered perspective, which is still quite rare. So can you tell me a little bit about that? I, you did talk about your brothers, your brother and your sisters. and <laughs> it was, It's likely part of the genesis of it. But as Bruna and I were exploring um, what, how we wanted to present this product to the world, we kept coming back to this phrase. It was important that we have a point of view. And we wanted to be clear in our voice. Um, in expressing that point of view, we knew we wanted to create, we came up with the, um, came up with uh, the same word, uh, but we landed, we kept navigating back to the word inclusive. We wanted to, um, and I think throughout, threaded throughout perhaps our, um, uh, our corporate um, page, um, as well as the use of that um, concept and term. We wanted to make sure we were fully inclusive. And for us, it, mean, it meant being an ungendered fragrance. Hmm. For us, because of our nature, we leaned into a fine, the fine end of the spectrum, but being ungendered was important. Having a, when we decided to, to present it, we knew we wanted pictures that reflected the global nature of human life. When we thought about sourcing content for our product ingredients, read, um, we knew we wanted to tap into the continents. And we literally have tapped into six of the seven continents to make sure it was reflected in that, that um, product. We knew that we wanted to stay as close to natural as possible. Mm-hmm. It's almost impossible to be 100%. Totally. Um, but we, knew, we knew we wanted to lean as close to that as possible. We knew we wanted to lift up the vegan voice. We ultimately knew that all those things for us manifested itself in the individual artistic expression. Mm -hmm. And it was that individual artistic expression that we tried to package both in terms of the content of that bottle, the naming, the selection of the bottle, how we went about talking to in numerous people through focus groups, et cetera. It really was a full on analytical, deep dive, developmental, collaborative (laughs) process uh, for us. Um, I find that actually that global perspective very interesting. And it of course ties in with my own interests. So not to be self-serving, but you know, there is this narrative of perfumery as being this sort of thing that comes down to us from, 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 you know, 17th century France. And, and the, of course, as we all really know, the, the nature of perfume is global, it's multinational, it's on every continent through time. So um, how do you relate to that trajectory of perfume history? I mean, what are you drawing from? Um, it's not appreciably different, I don't think, than the way people think of history in general. Yeah, people, no, yeah, totally. Eurocentric. Homogeneity. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it's, and it's not that. Life yeah. began on Africa. Do we think the place where life began, they wouldn't have adorned themselves in fragrances? Yeah. Of course not. When I was traveling, again, part of the, just my evolution and Brenda's, when I was traveling through Europe, uh, I was on a train from, uh, I think I was leaving from uh, uh, Paris at the time, and I was going through the Swiss Alps, I was going to Zurich, um, and um, uh, Belgium, and uh, 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 um, I don't know, some other cities. Um, And uh, when we were in the uh, 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 Swiss Alps, um, I was in a train car, and in that train car, I I used to fashion myself, my grandfather was a linguist, I struggled with language, but I always tried. And this was before the days for people on the line where you could download an app. And totally. maybe, you know, it was me with a book trying to make sure I could communicate. There was a gentleman who spoke French and English and German. There was a gentleman who spoke old world German. There was somebody there who spoke Spanish. And there was me who struggled with the French and the English, and et cetera. And the old gentleman, as we, as we were going through the Alps, was sharing with me a story about that he wanted me to know that I was traveling through the land where they found the first human. And that first human happened to be from African African descent, a, 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 
the scent. And he talked about what they found in the tomb, um, jewelry, bottles that they assume were fragrances, et cetera. Mm. This man I'd never met before. I was sitting there with a book trying to figure out how to communicate with people. We, to, the four of us together, traded language to language to language wow. so that he could share this story with me. Wow. I bring that to everyone because that's the global kind of build thing that we, and that, um, Brenda and I built upon. And when you think about it in its artistic form, it takes it to a completely different place. Yeah. Totally. The, the, the challenge, though, of course, is that the research, you know, done in the history of scent has typically been Eurocentric. And I mean, we have this initiative called, um, well, it's called Scent and Society, you know, and what we're trying to do is research uh, cultural history of scent outside of, you know, the Euro, Euro, European lens, you know. And, and I'll tell you, it's, it's hard. There's not that many research, you know, there's a couple scholars here and there who maybe touch on scent, but really the research hasn't been funded and supported and that's a problem. It's a problem. You know? It's interesting yeah. to share that with that uh, because I was uh, doing some leisure reading the other day and I was in search of an artist. Uh, Brenda and I have started the process. You will also discuss this a little bit, just looking at different artists, yeah. going at your emerging artists uh, for our philanthropic arm. And um, I was, I, I, in that search, it, it reminded me of what we were doing when we were trying to name our products. We, you can see the names are reflect artistic expression. Mm -hmm. When people were showing pictures of those who have surrealism as an artistic expression, every person that populated first uh, were European. That's yeah. cool, but it's incomplete. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I had to really search because I'm used to doing research by nature of the profession. I had to really search to find the surrealism connections in Asia, the mm. surrealism connections in Africa. Yeah. Um, uh, Frida uh, is more known with respect to um, uh, the Central, Central America. Yeah. Moment, but still, it was it was amazing when when Brenda and I were engaged in. Uh, we knew we wanted to have a forward-looking um, brand on the artistic side, but one of our, the names we came up with, Nomadic, for a certain uh, expression, it was intended to evoke that tradition, and in this case, African and Asian uh, nomadics. And even in searching for nomadic artistic expression, it was a chore. And that's when we build it, when we were building the layer, when thinking about the layers of uh, the identity near a fragrance line, we were very intentional. Yeah. Ungendered, we find fragrance because sometimes when you're a person of color, there's some um, perception as to whether or not one can pr produce that. We knew we could. So yeah. we wanted that to be part of the, the description. We wanted the global sourcing because in our collective travel, we understood the richness of what that represented. Yeah. And to leave one part of ourselves and one part of the world out of this multi-layered textured uh, product seemed um, less than inclusive. Yeah. Um, we wanted to make sure that voice was surfaced. Um, in a way that was differentiated, hence the the birth of identity narrative. Yes, it's amazing. It's a great. It's I mean, it's it's so necessary. It's so timely. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your artists in residence program because you touched on it already. So so yeah, what are you hoping? I'll, and I'll share the link in the chat. But tell us all a little bit about that. So um, you probably saw from my bio and Brenda's as well. I serve on a lot of the voluntary boards. Um, I've been volunteering, uh, volunteering in aid space and housing space and uh, hospital space and um, women's health space and uh, education, et cetera, for a long time. And as we gave birth to the company, one of the things we wanted to do first is make in our company structure, we own both the manufacturing and distribution arm. That's differentiated as well for women. Um, but for me, I wanted us to make sure we had the controls there on the business side. 
But we knew day one that we were going to bake into that a philanthropic lens. Mm -hmm. And the artist in residence program for us is that. We knew day one that we weren't the only ones emerging, even though some of us are older souls, um, that we weren't the only ones emerging out there, that we, through our global travels, through our travels here in the U.S., have come across countless extraordinary artists who are unknown. So we did not want to limit the form of artistry. In our case, the form of artistry is fragrance, the scent what it does on the body, how one um, responds, hence the names, the creation of a surrealism, um, which is a bergamot base, um, and a new minimalism, which is just dead, which evokes a different feeling, a curation, which is the whole body, a exposure cameras, photography, which taught that beauty there, et cetera, composition. We wanted to surface and be able to surface artistry extraordinary, exceptional, emerging artistry, whatever the form. So this program is intended to do that. And towards the end of every year, we take a fresh look at it. We take a fresh look at, we offer, encourage people to submit their artistry um, so that we can highlight their artistry on our website as we get back to a place where we are physical again, interacting, that we can figure out ways to connect. We did with the, we're currently featuring um, Gear Gartley and his Project 44, which is a dance company out of New York. Exceptional, extraordinary body. Theirs is the art of movement. And it is just something special to watch. And we wanted to be able to lift them and share them with others so they would be able to experience that, their extraordinary artistry. And that will be baked into this particular brand. We will do that from its inception to wherever God takes us in its conclusion. <laughs> um, that will be part of our messaging because um, uh, some of us learn early on, each one take one. If we're mm -hmm. gonna lift the brand, what's wrong with also trying to lift another artist 100%. and their art yeah, and totally. showcase that yeah. and elevate that. And when you're talking about yourself and your brand, talk about them as well. It takes very little to do that. The impact can be significant. Yeah, I think that takes confidence. I think the reason people don't do that all the time is they're afraid that there's not enough for everybody, you know? We were there is. Yeah. We, we were warned. There were people who said, why would you do that? It's going to yeah. distract. I yeah. think it enhances. I agree. It's going yeah. to have people focus on something else. I think it tells them about who we are, about our intentionality, about our living inclusivity, about when we express identity narrative, we do it wholly. Um, and uh, so us, for us, it, it, it came naturally. Yeah, I think that's that's very cool. So I, everyone, I popped that link in the chat if you want to check it out. I also, you know, I realized we would be really remiss if we didn't talk about the fragrances. <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> come on. So I'm, I'm actually on your site and I've been looking through, you know, I see I see the ones you talked about. There's a couple titles that are intriguing. So there's curation, there's exposure, there's um, fetishize, which I'm curious about. What is that relating to? So um, all of these are art forms, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, writing, composition, um, the uh, exposure, photography, um, the paint, um, surrealism, uh, fetishize the body and what it does and uh, doesn't do, um, and usually in a sensual way. Um, and we, um, nomadic, uh, traditional, uh, continental uh, connection, and so each of these names are born of art periods. That art period also um, evokes certain personalities. So you'll see that when we were naming, this was again a, a protracted exercise Brenda and I went through, we named it based on the, the uh, uh, feeling, um, the expression of, uh, that that scent um, was intended to evoke. Uh, I'm going to start with surrealism, for instance, because it's, we've had an equal number of men and women uh, drawn into surrealism number 11. When we were doing focus groups, some people said, you know, that number helps me. In some instances, they were people who were dyslexic. Mm -hmm. um, they were inverting words, and that was a problem. But the That's number they were drawn to. Huh. Um, 
the word, um, the artistic period, um, the complexity of surrealism, its brilliance and the bergamot mixing with tea leaf, et cetera, doing uh, that um, surrealism, I, I raise that one because 50-50 male and female that have been drawn to that fragrance. Interesting. And it's very interesting to see how they react. It's also every fragrance that we try to develop um, and so far seemingly successful in that, that top note as it um, burns off in that uh, first five minutes or so, and that middle note the next uh, five, 15 minutes or so, and that long wearing bass note, the other thing about these scents is they manifest themselves really differently. And I recognize I'm the nose. So I'm, I, I, when Brenda applies a product and I apply, I have a different reaction, a different response. Brenda is drawn to something that my husband is also drawn to. Um, and in terms of scent selections and, but it manifests itself. It presents itself differently for different people. You were talking about fetish eyes. Fetish eyes mm -hmm. is a stronger scent. I've had men and women, uh, we have um, pursue uh, fetish eyes. It's very forward. It's I'm super very curious forward. about it. I'm, it's I, I, yeah. very intentional. It is a fragrance that if you're trying to claim a space, you wear fetish eyes. Because awesome. when you walk in the room, it's one of those kind of, you will, when you walk, it, it's not overpowering but it, it has a presence and it says, I want to, people to um, notice me, be drawn to me in this space. So I have a friend um, that is uh, in the uh, medical uh, field administrator of a you know, very large system. She says, I'll put one dab on for the day. Wow. So I go to them in the evening, I'm putting more than one dab because I'm trying to, um, after a 12 hour shift as a doctor, I'm trying to then be, um, evoke something different. And I can do that by then uh, layering, uh, adding additional amount of that fragrance in the evening. So it carries me uh, through and it, it emits something else um, um, in, in the room. So it, it's, um, that's cool. I, 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 I'm going to ask this knowing full well that it's the worst possible question to ask an artist of any sort. Oh, here we go. Is it? <laughs> What's your favorite one you've made? <laughs> well, like, I'm sorry. Baby, like all babies that one gave birth to, you don't, you know, I grew up in a family with uh, seven children. If my mother would have said I prefer her over him, you know, it would have been a problem. I don't totally. have experience. It really is in the moment. Uh, what I'm drawn towards. And we wanted each curation is a lighter fare and more common from a, uh, I apologize. I don't worry. You're, you're, you're a busy woman. I uh, do not apologize. Uh, <laughs> um, it, it, it's a very, it has this vanilla, self assured. So for me on the business side, I'm probably going to wear that a little more. Um, because I'm trying to evoke confidence, and for me, it does that. Um, but it depends on my mood. It depends on the place. It depends on what I'm trying to convey. It depends on how I want to, others to react to me. Some of these fragrances, I was um, um, interacting before uh, the pandemic with a young man, a uh, lovely fellow, was about to get married, and he didn't have his own fragrance. So I went with him through every fragrance. He sell, settled on new minimalism for him. And then he asked me, he whispered to me, he said, tell me how to wear it. And I said, I didn't know what he meant at first. I said, what do you mean? He says, in my family, it wasn't, war fragrance wasn't worn. It wasn't. Oh, wow. Wow. And, and you share with me. And he was, he whispered it. This was a personal moment for him. And I, it took me to a different place in terms of what fragrance will do for people. Um, and I talked to him about where he should apply it and how much he should apply. And, and why, and, and he was so thankful. He came around the, the, the um, dividing desk at the time and hugged me. Pre-COVID. He, <laughs> he said, I, did, I wanted to ask somebody, but I was concerned. This young man may have been his in his late twenties, 
and no one had talked to him about fragrance and what it meant and that it was okay and how to apply it and where to apply it. And sometimes it's on the body and sometimes it wipes in a room and sometimes you can apply it on a thing and depending on what you're trying to achieve, et cetera. And at the end of that conversation, I just felt it was just one of those, another affirming moments that you can have an impact on someone's life. And new minimalism for him had that impact. Donna in the chat says, um, you're like a fragrance guru, <laughs> which, which just sounds like that experience really was for him um, a moment of realization and also permission, right? Permission to... Right. I, wanted yeah. him to, um, I knew it was important the way he looked at me. Um, fragrance communicates in so many, on so many levels. People usually just think about the nose, but people react in a certain way once it's applied. Um, and he wanted to experience that. Um, and I, when he leaned in to pose his question, it was clear from the way he looked at me that this was important to him. Mm. And I needed to treat it as such. That's um, that's really profound. It sounds like yeah, it sounds like he had that moment of, okay, I can actually do this, you know, which is it's an identity thing, right? It changes the self perception. Yeah. Is there anything you're excited about that you're doing next? You know, well, just sort of facing forward. Um, sure. While people are thinking about questions, at hello at identitynarrative.com. Again, oh. learning a young man. If you have something you want to pose that you have not, you're not comfortable in a group setting, you'd like to um, pose it um, individually, you're trying to lift a business and you want to lean into some of my thoughts on uh, formation, just send an email to identity, hello at identitynarrative.com if you want to talk about the fragrances. Of course, we're delighted to do that as well. Um, and uh, we will, I'll make sure that we respond. In okay. terms of our next, one of the things that we, we're always developing fragrances. So we've got lots of those kinds of things in the hopper, trying to think about um, not simply what the, is the next thing, but what is the next right thing? What draws us? What haven't we done in the fragrance spectrum um, for this brand that we need to do next? If there's a scent profile that is missing. So we're in the process of looking at all of that, but we're also lifting our home line. We have a hundred ounce a home spray, uh, which is an atomizer. Um, and we've uh, developed a, uh, a diffuser uh, called Fire Rock uh, for the home. As many of you know, uh, we're gonna be in this virtual world for a while, um, but we also have learned that we wanna create um, a mood within our homes, within our um, office space. Now we know that that has an impact on our creativity, our joy of the moment, um, et cetera. So we're looking at those things, um, the, the home component um, as it relates to fragrances. Which is uh, so prescient of the question that, that Lindsay asked in the chat here, which is as life continues to move into the digital sphere, what do you think the future of fragrance and experiencing the world through scent may be? Um, I we, I, I, uh, before we went into uh, um, the, the closed space, I went to a session. Um, this particular session had Divi men. Um, they, uh, in this instance, they happened to be gay. Um, um, and they were asking me about alternative applications for fragrance. Um, so we had a wonderful discussion around what that looks like. Um, and this isn't just for men of uh, any um, uh, uh, leanings, this is for people, um, but it was the home experience, creating that intimacy, because they were trying to be, this particular group of gentlemen were trying to be thoughtful about how that manifests itself. They didn't want it to be, they, they wanted to, it to be differentiated. So we, I, we talked to them about how you apply and can apply, not directly, fragrances uh, on sheets or on a uh, behind the tie, or um, beyond the crook of a neck, or et cetera. And it was interesting to have that uh, discussion. Um, and in part, it affirmed our desire to bring things into the home that allow people to transport. In this pandemic, um, in our virtual world, uh, we are all trying to continue to move forward, to present ourselves, to be whole people. Sometimes just having a scent in the room helps us to, to do that. 
sometimes, frankly, we need to be transported. Um, I was in Morocco and uh, Spain and Portugal in September, and I'm grateful, grateful that I was able to get that, that trip in and discover some new spices, uh, et cetera, that we hope to be able to incorporate down the road. Um, but I can bring in certain consent combinations and it'll take me back to that moment and transport me not just to the experience, but to who I was in that moment. Mm. That's what fragrances in a home can do. And so it seems like a, a natural evolution for us. Yeah, I, I love the idea of you in Morocco finding new spices and materials and incorporating that. It's, it's just, it's so old school. It's such a pure way of approaching scent, you know, finding the materials, being inspired by the places. It's, it's, it's evocative. Um, all right, folks. Well, we're, we're a little past time. And as we all can guess, Mary is a busy human being. <laughs> so I want to make sure to let her get uh, back to her life. But if anybody wants to just chime in and say hi, um, please, please do. Um, if everybody's chiming in, just for those who tuned in, thank you for doing that. I had no idea if anyone would tune in. Um, so, but thank you for doing that. For those who are tuning in, trying to find their creative path, I wish you all the best. Um, continue to not accept no and pursue whatever your passion, your dream happens to be. Uh, for those of you who need encouragement, I'm encouraging you. For those of you who um, are feeling uh, stopped because someone said no, listen to your yes. Wow, she is amazing. Um, thanks everybody. Have a wonderful day and we'll see you all on the internet. See you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.